I'm Alexa Schlosser, the managing editor of A to Z, AAST's magazine. Um, and I'm here today with Brendan Duffy and Larie Fordyce, and we're going to be talking about the importance of the CCSH credential. So to get us started, Brendan or Larie, either one, um, in general, why is the CCSH credential so important? Uh, interactions with the patients now. There's so much technology and so many wearables and so much compliance data that it comes, uh, it becomes important that you have a, a greater depth of knowledge as to perhaps some of the information that wasn't there when we all became sleep techs. And day to day it becomes even more important as, as the technology keeps evolving that you keep up with it. And our roles in sleep have changed and may continue to change where it's less of a, a sleep tech in the lab as opposed to a sleep educator or a sleep monitor or coach outside of the lab. And I also think that, um, you know, having said when you said that sleep has evolved and our jobs have changed, that um, it, the patients have gotten sicker over time, it seems, and it's no longer that now the nurses take care of them or the RTs take care of them. We've kind of left all of that to the sleep lab when those patients come in. So we have to be more knowledgeable in all different areas, not mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. technically in sleep. Right. That makes sense. Um, so why would a registered sleep technologist want to get their CCSH? What are the benefits? I think it affords them more opportunities. I mean, me as a manager, if I have somebody that's coming in and, and one of them has showing that shown that interest and and self-growth that they've gone ahead and gotten it, then I would probably opt to think highly of that person just because they've already had the registration, which is maybe what they needed to get in the door, but it shows that they're in it for the long term mm -hmm. and that they're willing to continue to learn. And many people have been sleep techs for a long time, such as myself, and this is kind of another way to show growth, you know, personal growth mm -hmm. in the field, as well as, you know, you just don't watch people during the night Sure. You do other things. How has um, the CCSH, maybe the exam, or, or kind of what it means to be one, changed since I, I assume you both do have your CCSH? Mm -hmm. um, how would you say, do you know how it's changed, or how long have you had yours, I guess? I'm going to say a year and a half, two years. Same. Yeah, probably, we probably got it pretty early in the process. Gotcha. Um, so I think when I got it, it was only up to 800. I'm not sure where they are now. Um, but the exam is different than the registration exam in mm -hmm. that it's a lot more critical thinking. It's not just pick one of these four answers is correct. It's John Doe is the patient. Here's a lot of things going on. And here's some of the things that you could work through. And you have to pick the best answer. Now, there may be two or three good answers there. Mm -hmm. But you have to, critical thinking is a skill uh, that you really need to be successful in that test. How to read and work through some options. And you really have to know what you're doing and how you, um, as Brendan said, you know, these critical thinking skills, what would be best for that patient? It's not just the right answer. You mm -hmm. know, you're given this scenario and, you know, you really have to work your way through it. Right. So would you say that the kind of questions on the exam are transferable to the actual work that a sleep technologist would be doing in their day-to-day? -day? Definitely. In the lab, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. and, and dealing with it almost like a social worker, where you're looking outside of the lab and you're looking not just what's going on in the lab, but what's going on in their home life. Mm -hmm. um, who's staying up late? Do they have kids? What are their schedules like? So dealing maybe not just the patient, but the whole family, and that's what a lot of these sleep coaches do. Mm -hmm. They'll go in and they'll work with the whole family. In sports, they actually have the athletes where they used to coach the athlete, and they found out the athletes actually perform better when they go to the athlete's house and work with the wife and the kids too because better rest for the athlete at home is going to mean better performance on the field. So it's not just the patient, but it's the whole unit. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we really don't see in, in the lab a lot that is a big part of the CCSH, I think, is insomnia. I mean, a lot of people think the biggest sleep disorder is sleep apnea. The biggest one that we treat is sleep apnea, but the biggest sleep disorder is insomnia. Part of that could end up being sleep apnea, but the CCSH really covers insomnia and cognitive behavior therapy and things like that that we really didn't worry too much about for the registration test. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and you know, we didn't, 
as well see a lot of those patients in the sleep lab because unless you had sleep apnea or some of the other disorders that needed to, for you to have an overnight sleep study, then you would come into the sleep lab and insomnia was like, well, if you're not gonna sleep anyway, then it's kind of a wasted study. Sure. Right. Whereas now we're working with these people to try and get them to sleep better. Yeah, and they really don't want them to have a sleep study if they have insomnia, if they really think it's that path because that's not really what you're trying to, mm -hmm. to, to fish out, to comb out. And now, so, for those of us that you know do that type of testing or work with these patients and work with CBT uh, or cognitive behavioral therapy, you know we, you know, had to learn how do we treat a patient looking like you said into their life, into you know what are the other members of their family doing, and being able to keep them on track so that you know the cognitive behavioral therapy will work for them. Sure, oh, that makes sense. Um, so how would how do you know if you're if you're ready to take the CCSH exam? How did you know you were ready? I went through the practice exam, and there are a couple of good um, study guides out there. One of them was a nursing book, uh, and another one was Dr. Krieger. And Dr. Krieger's book was excellent because it actually gets into questions the same way I was mentioning. Here's a scenario, and here's a couple of steps. And you, and you take your shot and you find the right answer. And if you, if you can't, he'll explain his choices as to why your answers were maybe not the best answer, but good answers. So it was a good practical way to get ready for the type of test that you were gonna take. And as well, Dr. Barry's book, The Pearls of Sleep Medicine, it was the same thing. They gave you the scenarios and you were able to mm. work your way through that. And I think though, though, you know, a new sleep technologists wouldn't be able to write the registry exam and then they'd be ready to do the CCSH. Mm -hmm. you, you know, working in the field a little bit, dealing with more patients, um, and, you know, as you, you know, promote yourself from working to a night tech, maybe working days and seeing more of what patients do on a day-to-day -day basis, then, and that would show that you're more ready to do the sure. test, I guess. <laughs> And you can help yourself while you're on the job at night. I mean, I always tell my techs, don't just look at the two patients that you have that you are working with, but look at all the patients and read through their histories because that's how you're going to grow. Because that patient may have different comorbidities than the other one. So you want to see how they ended up, um, what extra things they had to do to get that person compliant. Follow them through if you see them the first night. Maybe you don't have them the second time for when they come back for CPAP, but they were horrific or something else was going on. They really had a, a difficult time. Follow them through to see how they go. And that's how you learn what the doctor's moves were and, and what the other techs had to do for that patient. And I also encourage my techs to talk to the patient and ask them questions, like you said, read through the history, because they are not always forthcoming with the physicians. And so sometimes when you talk to them, you you know, you get a bit of a different answer as yeah. to, oh, this is what's really going on. And, you know, then they can come up with their own conclusion and match it with whatever the physician said. And like you said, follow them through. Find out what hap what did the doctor do with them a month down the road. Right, that's great. Um, so what, what additional skills does a CCSH credential um, sleep professional bring to the care of, to the sleep of patients? I think to me it shows that you've gone the extra step um, to get accredited. There are, there are some companies online that are sleep companies and there are cer certifications from online courses. But what they miss is they don't have the clinical experience that the registered tech does. So they may not know when it's time to turn that patient over to a doctor. Uh, they may not recognize sleep apnea. You know, I've seen even in the, the sports folks, a kid sleeping on the bus, sitting up, a football player, and he's choking and breathing, and they're messing around, putting some kind of gummies in, in his mouth while I'm looking at it. And this was a company that was working with them, and I'm looking at them and say, you really may want to get that person for a sleep study because it seems like they probably have sleep apnea. So in those situations, I think it, it, it helps to, to have that background. And CCSH is a reputable certification. Um, you know, it is through the BRPT or the Board of Registered Polysomnographic Technologists, and they have, you know, taken all the questions and it's psychometrically validated. So when people take the exam, those are, you know, it is a, 
I guess I should say it's a su assumption because that's a poor word, but it is an assumption that, you know, if you can make it through these questions that are validated, that you can do the job and you've earned that credential. Whereas Brendan said, sometimes these, these other, you get a certificate, but it doesn't mean that it was validated by anyone. Sure. Right. Or what the background of those people that are processing the certificates are. Mm -hmm. Uh, American Academy of Pediatrics said that a lot of the sleep coaches out there, about 50%, have neither the clinical background nor the academic background uh, to be involved in that. You know, and for the CCSH, um, you know, one of the entry points in order to take the exam is, you know, they want you to have an associate degree or a bachelor's degree and a thousand hours in clinical sleep. So that's a, you know, a significant amount of sleep. Also, if you've been in our PSGT for more than five years, then they think you're ready to go and take that exam. Yeah, that makes sense. That's the, the clinical and lab seems to be the really important part there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To have that experience. It's a breadth of experience, especially if you're at a lab that deals with children and adults. Uh, you get a lot of information that five years. Right. Mm -hmm. So do you think, um, you know, with what we've talked about, the, the CCSH being so important and, you know, um, worthy of and standardized and all of that, do you think it receives the esteem it deserves? Um, and then how, what do you think could be done to promote it and to, to make that seem more widely known as, okay, if you have a CCSH, then we know that you're top notch? I think it's getting there. It's still young. It's still, mm -hmm. it's still relatively young. Uh, so I think little by little, there'll, there'll be more opportunities. And I know I have a couple of people calling me already that are physicians, and they want to use educators with different projects that they have. So they like it, and they know that it means more than some of the other things that are out there because they're familiar with sleep taxes, register tax. So it's kind of, um, it's kind of good. And I'm starting in the last week or two, I've gotten two different calls on different projects, one with cognitive behavior therapy, and another one I still have to find out what it, it's an online app. And I think they wanna maybe use the sleep uh, CCSH educators involved with some of the apps that are out there, maybe to support folks using different apps. So there's a lot of things that, that may come about that we can't even, that these people that are running these shows once we tell them what, what is involved in it, they seem to like it. Sure. And there are some states that have already, you know, determined that, you know, this is quite a significant and, you know, a high ranking credential because there's actually billing codes for CCSH if you have that credential. Sure. So it's, I think it's out there and it just goes to show you, mm -hmm. you know, that it is worthy of getting. Yeah, it seems like it, as once it becomes part of the, the overall process and the kind of systemized, then it'll gain more traction too, mm -hmm. and people will be more aware of it. So. Yeah, and in the hospital, we've seen Christina and other folks have started programs where they actually are going into the hospital and working with patients that are in the hospital already that nobody ever talked to before about sleep. And because of that, a lot of times these people come back within 30 days where the hospital gets penalized. And not only that, but it's not good for the person's health, that maybe if we could figure out their sleep, other comorbidities will, will improve also. So right. mm -hmm. they're using it in that vein. Great. Well, that kind of uh, goes through the questions that I had for you. Is there anything else on the credential that, that I missed or that you would want to impart to our viewers? I think there's a lot of opportunity. I think folks uh, realize, are starting to realize, and now I see any time we have a course, there's, it's always uh, a full course whenever it's offered oh, by AAST or Kentucky Sleep offered at one time, but I have not gone to, or I have not gone anywhere where I've seen three people in this course. Yeah. So people realize it, that, that there is something there, they're not sure exactly, but I would tell them it's definitely something they should be looking at. And I think more and more people should do it, like even if the people I'm suspecting, you know, because the courses are always full, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure that everyone's taking the actual exam mm -hmm. because there's only a thousand CCSH credential, mm -hmm. you know, members. So I, you know, would hope that as it gains more traction, people should, you know, be thinking about if this is what I want to do for my job, then that is something they should go for. Absolutely. Okay. And if you're looking to get off nights, it may be a day job. 
because yeah. they're starting to become the folks in the hospitals that are working with patients down in the, uh, you know, inside the hospital as inpatients or also as compliance experts, you know, where the doctors get stuck for time more and more than depending on these folks to kind of fill in some of the gaps. Well, that concludes this installment of Sleep Spindles. I want to thank Brandon Duffy and Larry Fordyce. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.